Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. We believe at Deep Adventure Ministries, our creed is that the most radical thing, the most radical quest you can have in life is to abandon yourself to the wild adventure of God's will. And it's been wild out here in Waikiki this summer. We've had the biggest uh, swells that I can ever remember, and uh, consistently, like one swell comes, it goes, and the next one hits. And and it's like that, dropping into, uh, paddling into God's will with all your might, uh, is a great adventure. It's a great ride. We're going to be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Kickstart that engine and roll thunder with the pack. Explore the grittiness of manly spirituality. Gain traction in the virtues. Zoop up your spiritual engine by turning adversity into adventure. Now here's Bear Wozniak. Let's ride. Aloha, and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I uh, want to invite everybody to go to our website, deepadventure.com. My, Sophia has just uh, released two of my books, uh, Surfer's Guide to the Soul, as well as Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. And we want to invite you to go, go there, check it out, check out our web store. Uh, we have a guest with us today, Deacon Charlie Echeverry. I met him at the OSV Talks in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And uh, he's a motorcycle rider. He's a fitness uh, guy, he's uh, in Napa at the Napa Institute right now. In Napa, I'm so jealous of you, Deacon. How how how's ev- how is how is everybody there? Well, it's a it's a beautiful spot, as you know, because you've been here. Um, it's at the Meritage Resort uh, up in Napa Valley, and it's a uh, it's it's just it's physically a beautiful place, but it's also really cool that um, all these folks from all different walks of life gather to talk about you know obviously gospel principles, but how we apply those out in the world. And so it's exciting just from a networking standpoint, just meeting different people and having conversations. And I'm always amazed by just the impact of getting two people together who may be working on something that's similar, or maybe they're, they have the one part that the other person's missing, and you kind of bring them together and they complete the whole. So it, it's, uh, it's really great. All kinds of apostolates, all kinds of uh, Catholic media, all kinds of authors, you know, folks like you, you know, uh, speakers, um, presenters, that kind of thing. Uh, but it's a it's a really really beautiful spot and uh, and a great time. And you know it's it's like I, what I sponsored the cigar cigars uh, one one uh, yeah. at one of the events. You know my, the the Bear Washington Deep Adventure the Seven Virtue Cigars, which you could get at deepadventure.com. dot com. That's my little commercial. But it, the th- the cool thing is they do have this wine tasting or this whiskey and and and, and cigar night every night. That's where a lot of the stuff happens because it's it's everybody involved in the new evangelization and every every di- different area from all over the world. And you and you have these you make these, I mean, it, you when you leave there you're just like oh man my heart's breaking because I met so many great people, but there's also something there where you can help to push some someone's ministry to the next level and they can, they can help you too. So I so I really wish I was there. I especially love the fact that there's always a mass going on 24 hours a day, sure. And it's the the resort is dedicated to Mary, and that wine. Uh, that that cave or whatever you call the grotto where the the grotto. wine casks the wine yeah. casks used to be, is now where that beautiful masses are. It's just a gorgeous place. It is. I should have mentioned that that there's about there's fifty believe it or not five zero liturgies that take place here over the span of just a few days, and I should have mentioned um, the great presence of bishops of priests of religious. I mean this place is chock full. It's actually funny because I think about the fact that you know we're in a resort, so it's not like the whole resort is taken up by Napa people. And so the expressions of people who are just here on whatever vacation or they're just, you know, or even the employees of the place, right? As you know, things like Eucharistic processions pass by. And it's been really beautiful to see that kind of experience of how people interact with the faith who are not necessarily in the conference, but they're just experiencing it. But that's a really cool part. And on the cigar bar, you, you know, it, this is no offense to the current sponsor. I actually don't know who the sponsor is, but we could have used some bear, some bear cigars because they were, uh, they were not to my liking. The, the, uh, I, I tried it. Though. The first uh, negative but, thing ever said about the Napa, the Napa gathering. Oh, I, I better come back next year. All right, and bring my what? bring bring the the deep virtue cigar samplers. We have them at our website, and they are great. They are great cigars, but there is just something about when you when you first drive up, you can sense the presence of the Holy Spirit, and it's the pres- presence of sure. Jesus in the Eucharist too, and then the, just the the devotion and the love for Mary. Meritage. I don't know exactly what that word means, but I know it has something to do with Mary. Mm-hmm. And there's well, and so yeah the the M the, the 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 what is it called the 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 graphics that are used the, the, the graphics that, that are used classic yeah, the, letter M 
Exactly. The, and, and, you know, uh, Tim Bush, who owns this resort and obviously hosts the Napa Institute, has his own um, uh, vineyard kind of wine brand. It's called Trinitas. And, mm. and throughout, throughout every aspect of this property, there are, uh, you know, odes to our Blessed Mother. And you definitely feel that presence. You know, the cool thing about Napa, too, Bear, is that um, and I kind of lost track of this because it's been so hot in California. I mean, it's been like 90 plus even coastal areas have been very hot the last several weeks but when you come here because it is the napa valley right it's just like really it's like a little oasis right which is why wine is so good from this part of the world and it's because it's really cool and it, it there's a little crispness and humidity there's an ocean there. sort of marine thing that goes on there even though it's like you know it, it, it you go you go 80 miles away and it's very hot but that yeah. little area well, you know, we're talking with with Deacon Charlie. We met at the OSV talks in Fort Wayne, Indiana. How was that first night there with the lightning storm? Uh, yeah, <laughs> that, was, that was pretty crazy. Yeah, the OSV talks, for those folks who don't know, is, um, you know, this sort of Catholic variation on what uh, is a format called the TED Talk from, you know, some people might recognize that. But it's really, it's it's people, you know, like you who are, um, you know, just people who are living an integrated Catholic life and who have something to say and something to share. And they give these talks. And, um, you know, they've done this as, I guess, the third season, if you will, of those talks. Um, and you and I were there at that recording. And, uh, yeah, there was a super wicked uh, electrical storm the first night of it because, you know, the enemy uh, tries to screw things up all the time, especially when there's good fruit that's going to be born from it. So I kind of just chalked it up to that. But it was pretty brutal because, I mean, even the, the resort that we were in or the hotel that we were in, everything, the grid just shut down. I mean, you know, I didn't go to sleep that night uh, till 4 a.m., and I was really sympathizing for the speakers. I was the sort of unofficial chaplain of those talks, so I didn't speak this time. But I prayed over the speakers and spent some time with them, uh, a little spiritual coaching, that kind of thing. And I was really stressing for them because like those kind of things can knock you off your game in front of a big, um, you know, talk like that. And it is a big talk. I mean, it's in front of a live audience. It's professionally produced. I mean, it's super excellently done. And that kind of ratchets up the demands on the speaker. And so, yeah, they got thrown for a little bit of a loop, but um, but they rallied strong. Uh, and those talks are going to begin to roll out. I'm not exactly sure of the date, but uh, folks can check that stuff out on OSV Talks and uh, can't wait to, to see yours there. Well, you know, when we're, when we're rolling thunder uh, in, in Long Ride Home, people ask me, well, do you guys ever come under spiritual attack? And I go, no, never happened because we're, we're not under anything. We're on the attack. We're facing some resistance, but we're on the attack. And when you yeah. do see the enemy raise his ugly head, uh, it's, it's just profoundly uh, beautiful because... I hate, you know, you know that God's up to something and you know God's bigger and better. Satan's just a punk. And yeah. with, with, uh, with, with God um, for us who can be against us. And, and there, is, yeah. there is that time in our lives when we can face tremendous adversity. Uh, but if we just stay the course, uh, God is there with us. And if, if you're in God's will, you know, like as I said, my op- our creed is abandon yourself to the wild adventure of God's will. If you're in God's will, you get to see God move. If you're yeah. not there, you don't get to see him move. Uh, well, I, yeah, go ahead. I really, I really like that that um, kind of positioning of, of being on the attack. And, and, and what that is from my standpoint is the awareness that we are in a spiritual battle. I mean, that's half the fight right there is knowing that you're in one. Right. And you know, I tell this all the time to people. I do a lot of baptisms, you can imagine, as a deacon, celebrate that sacrament. And, you know, I, it's like inevitably bare. Like, you know, somebody's going to have a flat tire. Somebody got into an argument the in-laws didn't show up, the godparent, you know, something happened to them. There's always something, and I incorporate some of that into my homily, and, and the reality of it is, is that if we just can open our eyes to that spiritual battle, we're much better prepared for the slings and arrows that may come, but, you know, the enemy, he's pissed when you're, when you're you know, celebrating sacraments or when you're coming together with other faithful people to try to, you know, grow the kingdom of God, because that's, you know, that's, a, that's like a battlefront, right? And he wants to be active in that space, and of course things are going to happen. Um, in fact, here at the Napa Institute, I will say, I don't know if this is, you know, okay to share, but I'll just say it because I observe it as a difference. There's a, there's a much greater heightened security level here uh, this year than in previous years. And that's because, you know, there's been a lot of media attention increasingly to this conference and a lot of framing of this conference in a completely incorrect and unfair way. Um, and, you know, those forces that be create, um, 
antagonism and stress and whatever. And so, you know, rightly so, the conference has had to unfortunately ratchet up its sort of security profile uh, on the basis of that. But that, in a, in a way, is an image of that spiritual. Yeah, that's the way. visible. That's a visible that's reality of it. And the thing is, that we don't. T- we can't take God's protection for granted. That's not faith. That's presumption. Mm. But we need to be proactive, uh, pr- praying the rosary. I think, and and men and women in in your own homes. Uh, blessing, blessing your homes with with holy water, making the sign of the cross on, on every doorway, and and just and and just praising the Lord. You know the greatest the greatest spiritual, one of the greatest principles of spiritual battle, is praise. Mm. Uh, the, the the when Israel went out to battle, what came first was the chorus. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the choir went first in praising the Lord, and so our our greatest spirit, one of the greatest things you can do to fight the enemy is just to be thankful towards the Lord and say, "Thank you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus," and Amen. call Satan out and say, "In the name of Jesus, I bind you," and uh, and ask the Holy Spirit to come and uh, protect your family, protect you. Pray, ask for Saint Michael. Pray the prayer of Saint Michael the Angel, Archangel. So just to assume God's there to protect you is not the same as calling on the Lord. We need to be responsive to that. We're, we're, we're talking with Deacon uh, Charlie Echeverry uh, uh, from uh, Los Angeles, and uh, we'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. This is Daniel the Boone Markham with another episode of Country Up Fear. Years ago, during the midnight of my soul, I considered ending it all. My pain was serious hard to bear. Two things kept me going from self-propelling myself across the Grim Reaper's Bridge to Eternity. Concern for my children, and two, well, number two was the fear of God. When the love of God doesn't convince you, the fear of God will keep you. I loved my daddy, and my daddy loved me, but it was a healthy fear of my daddy that kept me from doing wrong. The prospect of my daddy's raw hide, meaty hand applied to my posterior was a mite troubling. I didn't fear daddy. I feared his hand, and that was a good thing. He never injured me, just applied the right amount of motivation where it was needed. I enjoy God's love daily, repeatedly. It feeds me, it comforts me, it warms me from harming myself and others and keeps me out of trouble. His rod protects me from the enemy and disciplines me while his staff guides and rescues. Folks don't like hearing about the fear of God. In fact, enlightened folks, so-called, think such fear is primitive religion or superstition. Folks like the shepherd's staff that rescues, but not so much the rod that is to be feared. Yes, fear means awe and respect, but it also means fear. Daddy's discipline only needed to be applied now and then. One episode left a lasting impression. Yet I had his companionship, protection, provision, and love every day. Isaiah prophesied that Christ would delight in the fear of the Lord. Since Jesus did so, seems to me we should be mindful of doing the same. This is Daniel the Boone Markham at countryup.org on a journey a few miles this side of heaven. Now you can journey with other men in the adventure of a lifetime, growing in manly virtue and servant leadership through Bears Man Cave non-Facebook community and our three-year school of manliness. Video, audio, and written content, as well as self-assessments help you to chart your new course. Join us at deepadventure.com. is a warning. The Bear Wozniak adventure is dangerous. The radical change Bear challenges you to is not for wimps. Change this station now to a soft rock station before it's too late. You've been warned. Now, here is Bear Wozniak. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want to let everybody know that our TV series Long Ride Home with Bear Wozniak is available for you to power watch. We love it. Uh, it's, of course, airs on EWTN every Tuesday night. 
Uh, but, you know, you can watch all of our episodes if you go to deepadventure.com and join uh, the Man Cave or the Mama Bears. And you get a, access, actually, to a secret YouTube link so you can share it with others. Uh, kind of use that as your evangelistic tool. But the good news is, is if you, part, if you join with the Mama Bears or the Man Cave, you actually... Um, you actually get early release. So right now we're, we're editing the Hawaii episodes and you'll have those uh, months before they air on EWTN. We're talking with Deacon uh, Charlie Echeverry. Hey, Deacon, where can people find you? You can just go to deacontcharlie.com, probably the easiest place, and you can check out appearances, my podcast, Living the Call, um, you know, any upcoming uh, talks, that kind of stuff. So deacontcharlie.com is probably the easiest place uh, to do that. How do you, how do you spell Charlie? C-H-A-R-L-I-E. Is there a butterfly over the eye? <laughs> no, there's not. <laughs> Unless my wife is writing it, maybe a heart. Well, speaking of butterflies, uh, you know, your love for motorcycles and uh, yeah. CrossFit, uh, functional fitness, as you call it, uh, what is a butterfly like you doing riding motorcycles? Yeah, no, no kidding, right? You know, it's funny because um, I, I fell in love with motor. You know, motorcycling to me was a love affair. And it's something that happened as a very young person. I think I was nine or 10. My family's from Colombia, from South America. And um, we would go every summer to visit my family and my cousins. My mom is one of 13 kids. My dad was one of five. So tons of cousins. In fact, we do a reunion every four years where we have, we basically take over a property and there's 200 plus people that go there. Um, but anyway, we would go every summer to Columbia to just, you know, be with the family and all that. And there was this kid right down the block. I mean, I was nine years old. There was this kid who had a, a little pit bike, a Honda CR50 uh, or CRZ50. I forget exactly what the nomenclature was. But this thing bear was candy apple red, had like a, you know, Jedi lightsaber blue seat. And the moment I saw it, it was a moment of like awe in your little kid brain. You know, I, I saw it. I saw this kid a little older than me, but not much, just tooling around on this bike. And then he invited me to jump on the back, believe it, going two up on a, on a pit bike. I mean, that, that's, that's the, my first experience. But just that sense of, of course, freedom. Um, but it, it's interesting. It's freedom, but it's also instantly kind of imbued with this sense of discovery and the sense of adventure because everything on a bike is different. For those who haven't ridden, every one of your senses comes alive in a very different way, right? When we right, ride around right, in a car, right. you're like in a, you're kind of in a bubble, right? You're in a, and increasingly, these bubbles are getting tighter and tighter and more sound ceiling. I mean, if you, anybody's been inside of a Tesla, you don't even, you don't even have to drive it. <laughs> You don't even have to drive. Well, that's exactly where I was going. It's like, you yeah. know, you, you're sitting in this, you know, basically a laptop that has wheels on it and it is, you know, airtight, hermetically sealed. Nothing from the outside gets in. It can drive itself. It's got lane assist. I mean, you're practically not even experiencing it. But on a motorcycle, it's the exact opposite, right? You're shifting. You are adapting to the road. You have to move your body in a certain way. You've got to counter steer. You've got to do all these different things. Every one of your limbs is active, right? You've got clutch. You've got gears. Every, every appendage is doing something. Brake, shift, whatever, throttle. All of those things are happening. And then at the same time, you have this outside reality, right, where the smell, the, the sense of smell, sense of sight. And the most important thing, which I didn't catch on until later on, is there is a very deep alignment to my mind and my experience in you know riding motorcycles and the spiritual life and in in and it begins with a sense of awareness a sense of presence because when you're on a bike you're aware especially if you're early days on a bike you know after a while you get a little bit like maybe a little too self-confident but early days on a bike you're paying attention to every little thing every car every sound and you're just in this heightened sense of awareness that oftentimes happens through contemplation meditation you know diving into lexio divina diving into the word that sense of awareness of knowing that just reality is happening is it, it's a great sort of hack to get to that point even at stages where you might not be there in terms of your spiritual journey but for me it was that it was like just getting you know sort of like rocket shot into this awareness level and mm. everything just came alive every color is more vibrant every sound is more interesting uh and and, and so th all of that really contributed to this love affair but it was this little tiny pit bike i mean it was a, a, and i i just i just fell in love with that sense and you know, after a lot of arm twisting with my parents, because they were not cool with it at all. But after some arm twisting, you know, a few years later, I got my first bike and it was uh, and this was in Florida at the time. Um, and, you know, I've just never looked back and, and uh, you know, I've had that love, love affair ever since. Well, I, I would always call it I'm going to go get some oxygen. 
<laughs> there you go. You know, because, yeah. if, you know, when you skydive, for example, they say you don't even really need to breathe because the oxygen goes right into your, right through your pores, your, oh, wow. into your system. Yeah. And when you ride in a motorcycle, unless you're all leathered up, you know, you're getting oxygen. And I, my, right. I guess one of the bad things for me is I've never liked to wear a helmet because uh-huh. the, the whole, one of the whole reasons I ride is that feeling of freedom. Yeah, and, absolutely. And I'm, I'm not recommending that, but, but, yeah. Um, and it's, it's one of those things, I don't recommend it either, only because you don't need practice at falling, right? It's not something that you have to be really an expert in. You just, it, one good time and, and that can be it. Um, but I totally understand what you're saying. And there's all different kinds of variations of riding, right? There's dirt, there's adventure, there's highway riding, and there's all different kinds of helmets. One of too my that- favorite things to do is to ride with my wife, though. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We've taken, in fact, actually, I just had my 20th anniversary. And my wife and I, when we first got Did married- Did your wife we- have one, too? She she just she had her she, an anniversary. That's a, no, that's a coincidence, right? Yeah, j- this is February second, um, and uh, and it, during our first honeymoon, we were, yeah, no, had no money, young young folks, and we just took a road trip, just went up the coast of California and then over into Nevada, Arizona, mm. and then back to L.A. And then this time we decided to go south, but we decided to do that on a bike. So we went mm. two up on a big adventure bike down into Baja, down into the Guadalupe Vine. Oh wine no, Valley. you're kidding! Oh yeah, yeah it was awesome. Wow. It was awesome. Um, and so I literally just did that with her. And it's it's a completely different experience when you have your wife with you. She doesn't ride herself, but she's a passenger. Um, that's what she prefers. Um, of course, well, I, pre- I prefer that, too. I love, I love I having my wife right there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, it's a great experience. And now you've got, you know, you've got some tech in the helmets where you can talk to one another. And the conversations that we've had riding are just amazing. Well, I love it when she has to move forward and whisper in my ear or kind of shout in my ear and and that conversation that goes on. But it's also, I like what you said the, about riding. It's the, it's the it, it brings you right into solitude. And even though it, you're going, uh, going at speeds and you've, you know, for me personally, I've always had loud pipes because I think it's a way to protect, to let people know I'm there. Sure. But in the midst of all that noise and, and all that motion, you reach a still point. And there's every biker I know, the people that I ride with anyway, um, they're praying the rosary or they're having a time of prayer or they're just that kind of, you know, the same thing is true of a, of a Western cowboy. Mm-hmm. You know, being yeah, on that horse, you better be comfortable with yourself. Absolutely. You're have a, yeah, go ahead. There's a great deal of peace. My buddy, uh, Blake Adams, who's been riding longer than I am, he actually builds and customized bikes as well. But he, you know, he, and he's on a search for God. So he's not a Christian. He's not a Catholic. Give him my book. Give me give my book. A, a, no, a no, surfer's, already, gu- a surfer's guide to the soul. I've already, and he's, he's in the water too all the time, but I, I've talked to him about you already as well. But, um, but he talks about it in his experience. He talked about looking out at the horizon and chasing the clouds mm. and looking for, looking for that moment of just, you know, what, what he calls, he, he actually called it the great amen. As this is a person who's not religious, who's not faithful, mm. but there is something about that even for him that, that drew him into it. So yeah, powerful it's not for everybody, it. but it's, it's a powerful thing. But, but, go, but along that same line, so you, yeah. you're all, you also surf and there's something there in surfing, especially in big surf, uh, you're, you're alone. I mean, even though you're out there and there's a pack of other people out, out there, there's not a lot of conversation uh, out there. You're kind yeah. of, you're alone, your back's to the Ina, you're looking out towards the, t- towards the ocean, and, you're, uh, and there's just this, and you're looking to the horizon, just like, like your friend, what, what's his name, by the way? Blake. Blake would give a shout out to Blake. I love that his statement. The great Amen is just great Amen. A beautiful. Yeah. Be, he, he, he's he's a writer. You can just tell. When, when he said that to me, it just floored me because again, this is a guy I've known for almost thirty years, and we've never once talked really about God until very recently. And uh, but he hit me with that, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, the surfing thing. I mean, I, I you know I, I I don't even know what the analogy would be. You're a surfer. I mean, I've been in the water a few times. I got a fun board, that kind of thing. It's not. I'm not at your level, but there is something that's very much akin to that, which is, and for me, it's a sense of, um, yeah, solitude and also of abandonment to God. Because when you're out there, you're abandoning yourself to that adventure that mm-hmm. you talk about, right? to the great swell, to, you know, frankly, to the fact that you're in an ecosystem where you're a foreigner to that ecosystem, right? You got lots of fish. Some of them are pretty big with big teeth that are flying around somewhere underneath. You got seals. I mean, I got freaked out one time when the first time a seal popped mm. up in front of me. It's a crazy thing. We to just see had a seal at grab someone by the head over here in Hawaii that just thought oh, they, yeah. they were just sweet domestic animals, you know, no, and just, those just two days ago, things. two days ago, yeah. just, so, just two blocks from here. <laughs> so when you, when you're, when you're out there and you're kind of floating on a board and you're by yourself and you're at the, at the sort of mercy of all these things, it really does teach you about vulnerability, about abandonment, about all these different things. Mm-hmm. So great, great spiritual uh, lessons to be drawn from, uh, from surfing specifically water sports in general, but surfing specifically because there's no tech, right? It's a board, it's you, it's nature, 
there's a real connection with creation. I mean, it's it's a it's a it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, and and, the, and again, it's it's going back to that that those times of solitude, whether it's on a motorcycle or or whether it's surfing or whether it's riding a horse or. I guess the greatest still point of all is probably that moment just before your canopy opens when you skydive, you know. No, uh, we're I haven't done that one yet. I'm, 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 sure, I'm sure it's on your list. We're talking with Deacon Charlie uh, uh, Echeverry, uh, and we'll be right back. We can talk a little bit more about his, his, his personal journey. This is the Bear Wozniak Adventure. This is Bear Wozniak coming to you from my home in Waikiki Beach. You know, every day I go out for a surf, and then later on at the end of the day, I do a long walk along the sands uh, in Waikiki to the other end, to the place where all the outrigger canoes are, are stored, and a lot of people come down and paddle their canoes. The other day I was out there, and this guy about my age is paddling in on a super light carbon fiber 22 foot outrigger canoe comes into the towards the beach flips the canoe up on his shoulder walks out of the water just straight out of the water in an area where I knew there was a lot of sharp coral and I went how could he do that and I gave him the shaka he walked in and then I looked where he had walked and it was super low tide and I could see that somewhere probably centuries before someone had cleared out a path about that wide through that sharp coral so he knew it he could get off his canoe and just walk in this is what lesson I learned from that is that the goddess, that's an ancient path through the coral that very few people know about. Jesus challenges us to follow the ancient path, to take the narrow way. The Didache said there's two ways in life. There's the, the wide way that leads to destruction and there's that narrow way, the way that leads to life. I want to follow that ancient path, the path that the magisterium of the church teaches us. When we did Long Ride Home, we rode in a big bed and country of Texas. And the closer we got to the Big Bend, the narrower and narrower the roads got. No one goes to the Big Bend country. No one passes through the Big Bend country of Texas. Uh, they don't pass through it. You got to intend to go there. There are two paths in life. One that's wide and easy and leads to destruction. And the other one that leads to life. Whether you spend eternity in heaven or eternity in hell is 100% under your control. Choose life. Choose to walk the narrow way. Jesus said, few there be that follow it, but when you follow it, it's its own reward. This is Bear Wozniak from DeepAdventure.com. You can gain traction in the virtues in my book, Deep Adventure, The Way of Heroic Virtue. And you can be inspired by my personal testimony of heartache, and triumph with my book, A Surfing Guide to the Soul, both newly published by Sophia and available at our web store, deepadventure.com and also on amazon.com. Hey, if you haven't been to the Bear Wozniak deepadventure.com web store, you really will be shocked what we have there. We have all of my books, and since I'm a Benedictine Oblate, we have the St. Benedict exorcism necklaces and rings and crosses too, plus tons of cool t-shirts for men and women, wrist rosaries, warrior rosaries, daily inspirational journals for either a man or a woman, and so much more. Our deepadventure.com web store is awesome. So check it out if you want to find the perfect gift. Aloha, welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We want to invite you mama bears out there to go to deepadventure.com and become part of the mama bears. I used to have a cabin two miles from the Canadian border right across from Glacier National Park, and I had occasion to, to uh, see a couple mama bears with their cubs, and uh, there's nothing more fierce than a mama bear. And uh, so we'd love for you to go and become part, you know, to participate in our ministry. There's a place for you there. We send you, uh, we give you access to, early access to our radio and our TV shows, and and there's other, there's among other things that you get by being a member. So we'd love for the mama bears to go to deepadventure.com. Join us there. And it's also a great place for you to find out more about how you can get your husbands or your sons involved in our bear school of manliness. Uh, that's at deepadventure.com. We're talking with Deacon Charlie Echeverry. Uh, you know, it's just interesting how um, sometimes you meet someone and you go, oh, yeah, there's just a click there. Okay, there's like lock, locked in when I met, when I met uh, Deacon Charlie. But the word deacon means so much to me. My father was a deacon. 
And yeah, you know, you even m- in the Bible, it says when you look at what's going to happen in heaven, there's a special place that says, and the deacons were here. Mm. You know, they're like, there's a special place in heaven for deacons. It's this very special calling. It's not something you can aspire to. It's something that the Lord calls you to. Can you talk to us a little bit about your personal journey with the Lord and, and, and the call sure. to the diaconate? Yeah, and I would say, I mean, it's a beautiful way to kick that off because the, the, the theology of the diaconate is, you know, in my mind, still being written. There's still so much of, um, of this ministry that the church is developing and expanding on, in large part because it was reestablished as a permanent order of the clergy very recently, right in my lifetime, basically. I mean, in the, in the early 70s, a little bit before I was born. But, but nevertheless, in modern history, we reestablished this ancient order, which has always existed, but fell out of sort of, uh, you know, everyday uh, utilization, right? Every priest is first ordained a deacon. Every bishop is first ordained a deacon and a priest. And that's just the way that it works. But the permanent diaconate as an order is a relatively new thing. Um, and, and there's a tremendous amount of beauty in that. I mean, for me, you know, my personal journey is, I, you know, I, I told you I was a bit of a spiritual knucklehead for a long time. Still I was, are, uh, still are to some degree. Still are. Thank you. Knucklehead, not spiritual. But I'll just say <laughs> right. Knuckle Drager, maybe more like it. There you go. Now okay. you're talking. Loud pipes save lives. Um, So, yeah, I mean, for me personally, it was um, I was, you know, brought up culturally very Catholic, but not really understanding the faith, Uh, you know, come from a Hispanic background, Latino background. It's kind of baked into the cake. You're just Catholic, but you're also just a fan of this soccer team and you're you like this kind of food and you listen to this kind of music. So it's very culturally imbued and it almost disappears because it's so much part of the culture. But, you know, we moved around a lot when I was a kid. I was born in L.A., but we lived in a number of different countries before I came to high school back in the States. And so when I got back to the States, I had to pick to be a Christian. I had to select Christianity in a different way because in the cultures that I grew up, it was just everywhere. So it was like electricity. You didn't have to think about it. But when I came back to the States, it was like, no, no, no. This is an intentional decision and one that, frankly, the culture at that time beginning to not support. And now it's reached kind of a you know a crescendo in terms of its lack of support for, for a Christian identity. But you had to kind of pick it. And so I, I, I said, yeah, I, I want to be a Christian. I want to walk in, in, in the ways of God. And I kind of started evolving there. And somewhere along that journey, but late, I mean, this is like you know late 20s, I came in, in contact with my first ever deacon that I could remember. I'm sure I'd seen some men on the altar before. I'm sure I'd maybe been around others, but I'd never paid attention to it. And it was this kind of moment of awareness, kind of like we were talking about earlier in the earlier segment about what happens on a bike, this sort of er- moment of awareness where I was like, wait a minute, what is, who is this guy? What is he doing? Why is he, you know, dressed differently, has different vestments? Uh, you know, after mass, he goes over and he hugs and kisses some lady. I thought that wasn't part of the deal. Like, what's going on there? Like, all of these questions started to, <laughs> yeah. you know, kind of pop up in my head. Deacon Tom Sable, who, by the way, is, you know, super great guy. But it's not like I, I ended up saying, hey, tell me about this. It was just I saw him. I saw him doing his ministry. And that was enough to get me to begin to question this. Uh, mm-hmm. and try to find out more about it. But it was a deep part of my reversion to Christ because born a you know, cultural Catholic, but again, I was just lukewarm and you know, off in the world and not really paying attention. And in the context of learning more about the diaconate, it was that process that actually brought me back to Christ, back to the church, going through that entire process as my wife at the same time was going through a conversion experience because she wasn't uh, a Catholic. And so these things are all interwoven. That's how God works. He kind of weaves this big tapestry and we're all kind of caught up in it. And we only see it in the rear view, right? We say, oh, wow, that's what, that's what was going on. But um, so it was, it was a deep um, curiosity and a sense of synchronicity with the diaconate. The more I learned about it, the more I understood it, the more I was like, yeah, that just, it's something that feels like you talked about. You just kind of vibe on something and you're like, oh yeah, that guy or that gal or that person or that thing, whatever it was, there was that with the diaconate. That's how it started for it me. It fit with you. Yeah, it did. And it was, um, you know, they ask you real quick, I'll tell you, they ask you at the very end of this process, right? For us, it was five, it was seven years all told, but it was five years of formation specifically. And at the very end of this process, Bear, they'd sit you in a big room and you got all these folks around you have been part of the formation, you know, team, et cetera, et cetera. And the director of the, of the diaconate for the Archdiocese of Los Angeles we're getting up from this meeting. We've been in there for four hours and we're getting up and we're saying, Hey, how do we validate our parking? We're shaking hands. We're saying goodbye. And at that moment, this man asked me, he goes, why do you want to be a deacon? 
And it was the most bizarre kind of question because we're, this is the end of a five year journey and we're wrapping up this final interview. And then on the way out, he asked me this question, which is a monumental question. And my answer to him was, you know, I, I can't even explain how I got in this room. I, I don't even understand why I'm here in a way. In, if, if for no other reason than to say this sense of great synchronicity with God and walking through doorways that he's opened and mm-hmm. that I've accepted, right? So is this, it's almost like this weird thing of like, you know, why are you married? It's like, well, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's hard to grasp like the one solid answer besides I'm in love with this woman, but it's, it's a series of things that you've responded to in the affirmative. And sometimes it's doors closing, but ultimately leading you to where God was taking me the entire time. It's beautiful. You know, there's that old talking hit song. It's kind of the counterpoint of this that says, is this my beautiful wife? Is this my beautiful house? What? Sure. How did I get there? But that's, that's right. not what you're saying. You, 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 what you did is you had a nudge and you followed it. You had a sense and you followed it. And, and that, that's the leading of the Holy Spirit, which is different than just falling, you know, just falling around, just kind of like letting your life take you where it wants to lead you. I know people will ask me so about this part of my ministry or that part of my ministry or what am I doing now? I just kind of always know the next thing I'm supposed to do. Yeah. I don't know the ones 20 steps down, but I just know like long ride home like I, or writing the book or starting the radio show or sure. m- marrying my wife. There was just like, yeah. and it wasn't me going, what, how did I get there? It was all intentional. I like you the way you say synchronicity. You, you have that sense of the leading of the Holy Spirit. But if you're out there right now and you're listening to this conversation, the Lord may be leading you, uh, nudging you. It's, it's, it's more like a tap on the shoulder. It is. If you respond to that, you're going to experience probably a little bit of a detour in your life, but you're going to experience fulfillment because God made you uh, just totally unique. The moment that he infused your spiritual soul with your human body at the moment of conception, he infused gifts, and along with those gifts, callings. And as you respond to that nudge of the Holy Spirit, uh, good things happen. And it's, uh, uh, not just not not that it's easy, um, but it's it's simple. It makes things clear. And I'm spe- specifically right at this moment. I feel like there's there, there there there's so many young men out there that are just confused. You know that girl that you're attracted to? Ask her out on a date. And you know that girl that you've been seeing? Ask her to marry you. If you feel that nudge, then what's holding you back? Don't let societal norms uh, hold you back. We need our men to respond to that call to heroic virtue. We need for you to say yes to being a man, yes to being a hero, yes to standing up to protect the vulnerable, yes to having ambition in the sense of having a direction in your life. You don't want to be a drifter. God has a plan. God says, I know what I have in store for you. I have plans for peace, not destruction, a future reserved for you full of hope. If you seek me, I will let you find me. Sit down with the Lord. I, I recommend you, you, you go skydiving, you grab a motorcycle ride, you go surfing, you step out of your comfort zone in some way, you go for a 10-mile hike in the mountains, you step out of your comfort zone, and then you sit down with a piece of paper and a pencil and say, Lord, what are you saying to me? And just begin to just begin to write your thoughts down. And, and, and in time... That that will become a vision, and there's and there's there's a sense in the Lord. I'm sorry, I'm getting off on a tangent here, Deacon, but no. there's a sense with the Lord in a, the book of Habakkuk. It says, "Write the vision down in letters big enough so the one who's r- uh, reading it can run while they're reading." Yeah, and it's like the, the the vision of a runner announcing a news of a victory. Write write things down. Develop clarity, Deacon. When I when when I. Uh, I'm about to do a new adventure. Like right now, I think the next thing on my list is is a sailing type TV show. Mm. Um, I have a notebook on my desk, a blue notebook that says sailing. And as thoughts come to me, I just put them in there, and eventually they be kind of become a plan. So yeah. this this becoming a deacon didn't just happen to you. You, no. you you responded to a nudge. You took the next step, and and, and now you're ordained. I'm sorry, I kind of went on that little rant here. But no, I, not at all. But we it, have to take I, it. We have to take a break right now. Can you hold that thought? Of course. We're talking with Deacon Charlie Echeverry, someone we're going to definitely have to have back on our show. Uh, Deacon, uh, how can they find you? DeaconCharlie.com. That's D-E-A-C-O-N-C-H-A-R-L-I-E.com. DeaconCharlie.com. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. That's right. 
Deep Adventure Ministries is grateful to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for underwriting the Bear Wozniak Adventure on EWTN. Notre Dame Federal Credit Union provides car loans, mortgages, SBA loans, and depository accounts nationwide, as well as 24-hour support. Go to deepadventure.com to find their link or go to NotreDameFCU.com. Mahalo to Notre Dame Federal Credit Union for making the Bear Wozniak adventure possible. We invite our mama bears to join our non-Facebook community created just for you, to share the journey with each other and to take the self-guided one-year course on the Virtues Plus, you have free access to all of the Long Ride Home TV show, all of the Bear Wozniak video version of our radio show, plus the Catechism in a Year videos, all at deepadventure.com. Aloha. Welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm just going to jump right in here with Deacon Charlie. Deacon, how can people find their God's will? How can people find their their their, their way in the Lord? It's well, you can, it, yeah. Everything begins bare. And I, I did want to just touch on one quick thing from the last segment because I think it's really important. You know, in the Gospel of John, Jesus tells his disciples, there is so much that I have to tell you, but you cannot bear it now. This idea of nudging is both the way the Holy Spirit talks to us, but it's also very practical given who human beings are. If we knew the whole story, if we knew the whole mission, the reason why we were made from the jump, we might run in the other direction scared out of our mind. So there's a very practical uh, uh, aspect to this, which is God has a great mission for every person listening to this, to this show. Um, and especially if, you know, if the audience is, you know, more men in particular, because there's now, you know, great need for us to rediscover, um, you know, that, the, the, the appropriate elements of masculinity and how to live that out in the world. But God has a great mission for you and a great plan for you. That's the reason you were made. And the reality of it is, is that he gives that to us through these nudges because he has so much to tell us. And the reality is most times in our life, we can't bear it the whole story. And so that's just an important part. In terms of what we can do, look, at the end of the day, God is incredibly profound, incredibly mysterious, and all these different things. And there's tomes and theology books and all these other ways. And I know you and I talked about books the last time on my show. And I can tell you that all of that is just the very tippy, tippest of the iceberg that exists. But at the same time that God is profound and mysterious and all these things, he's also eminently simple. What mm. God wants is for him to have a relationship with you. And that relationship is expressed in the same way that you express a relationship with other people. You spend time with that person. That's what, that is the currency of relationships. So step one, right? You know, if you, if you look at it from the charismatic process, right? Step one is realizing that you were wonderfully made, right? In the words of Habakkuk and the stuff you were talking about, you're wonderfully made. You've got an incredible, you know, mission. There's a plan for your life and I love you. That's like, you know, once you come to that understanding, then live in that relationship in a variety of ways. The church gives us dozens, hundreds, thousands of ways to experience that relationship and express that relationship with God. But then the world has other ways that we can do that. We've talked about some of them, right? So this idea of motorcycling and surfing and all this other stuff. Those are all opportunities to express and spend time with God in creation, in other avenues uh, of life. So, you know, step one is really spending time with God. Eucharistic adoration, praying a rosary, reading the Liturgy of the Hours. The Liturgy mm. of the Hours is like amazing and so amazing. underutilized. Yes. It really is. Great gift. Um, but even just mental prayer, Bear, even just saying at one moment, you know, if you're down on something, it's like, hey, you know, and, and call God dad, dad, you know, daddy, if you want. But like, spend time with me, hear me, you know, show me, like spend time with God. That is like the, the, the first principle really of of living and growing in that relationship. And there's a bunch of different permutations of how to do it, but all of them require in the same way you do with your wife, your brother, your sister, your neighbor is time with God. He, de he deserves that and you need that. That's the reality. And then from that flows everything else. I love what you said when we first talked, before we even started the conversation today, you mentioned accompaniment. Uh, and, and there's two parts to that. Part of that is that accompaniment of our, uh, of our walk with God and that we other need others to walk with us. You know, everybody has a great story. You know, uh, I forget where it is in The Hobbit, but uh, uh, now I can't even remember the, <laughs> the Hobbit's name, uh, who says, I wonder what kind of adventure. 
Yeah, I want for, yeah. I wonder what kind of adventure we're going to be. I wonder what kind of adventure this is going to be. Yeah, that that's that moment of conception when God infused your spiritual soul into your body, when a story began, and Absolutely. God has an adventure for you. And it and, and adventures. Louis Lamour said, "Adventure is just another word of saying something got really." It's a romantic way of something saying something really went wrong and really something, things got hard. But that's part of it is the adversity. So, uh, but think about think about Abraham. He he uh, he had a. Uh, God called him and said, go to this place. I want you to go to this place that I will show you. Abe had to check in with God every day. Sure. And finally God said, okay, here you are. This is where I want you. Uh, and, and, and so there was that accompaniment of the pedagogy, the journey with God. But there's also the, the, the brotherhood. Talk to us about the need for, for brothers. I'm sorry, you, but you had something else you wanted to say first. Well, no, you, you just reminded me of one quick thing when you, you, know, you, you talk about this um, in a way, it's sort of the way, what you just said is is a way of saying, um, you know, viewing, the, you know, life and everything that we do with a sense of wonder and a sense of adventure, um, and, and that's what it is. You reminded me though of uh, a priest friend of mine. So shout out to uh, Father Agustino Torres. He's one of the uh, Franciscans of the Renewal uh, out in New York, and um, he tells he tells stories all the time. He does a bunch of different speaking engagements and, and all that kind of stuff, but. Um, you know, he talked about like he travels a lot and when he gets on an airplane, he's like, all right, Lord, this mm-hmm. is going to be amazing. Right. Mm-hmm. It's like, who are you going to sit me next to? Right. Like, what, what's the conversation you want me to have? What are we going to discover? What, how, how can I be fed and nur- nourished by the interaction that I'm going to have? How can I do the same for this person, my brother and sister or sister who you're going to sit me in, uh, you know, next to? And so that sense of viewing everything, every moment as a sense of adventure and as a sense of a journey that God is kind of laying out. Is it just a super beautiful insight that 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 I think people who you know wake up in the morning and view things that way, you know everybody that I'm going to interact with, all of that, it really changes the chip a little bit and how we view even things that may feel mundane or kind of mm-hmm. you know, you know right. it's like miserable Mondays or what it's like. There is no miserable Monday. There's no there's, there's no weekend right in God's time. <laughs> yeah. It's all like, you know, a, a yeah. great adventure. In terms of brotherhood, look, I, I I've been really. Um, you know, high on talking about accompaniment. My, my thought on this is that, you know, accompaniment and all the teachings and all of the ways that the church expresses, you know, how we carry out this, uh, this mission as Christian disciples of Jesus, he, th- those things have always existed and they've always been true. But the Holy Spirit emphasizes certain things at certain times. And my great thought right now, and, you know, this period of time that we're living in, especially in, in America, frankly, is a time when I believe the Holy Spirit is emphasizing accompaniment, emphasizing the journey and the journey with a fellow brother and sister along the way. Now, again, that's always existed, has always been the case, but there's a special emphasis on it right now. And what I've found in my travels, Bear, is that you know, depending on what kind of camp you, you're in, either ideologically, spiritually, the way you like to practice, you know, experience mass, et cetera, you, you know, whatever camp you're in, there's either an emphasis on meet you where you are or an emphasis on show you the way, right? And what happens if we only think about that and we leave out the middle bit, which is let me walk with you there. The, the, what happens is you get some polarization and we have tons of that in this country right now. You've got the sort of, you know, meet them only where they are crowd, which is like, hey, uh, you're living a life of sin and I'm just gonna, you know, bring you a cup of coffee and, and give you a hug. Yeah, of course that's part of it. We want people to feel that they are not unworthy of God or unworthy of the gospel, of course. And then you've got the other camp, which is like, you know, hey, kid, lift yourself up and, you know, you're living a life of sin and here's the truth and the truth and all that. And all that is true. All that is true. It is true. But the middle bit, it, to my mind, is the part of emphasis right now from the Holy Spirit, which is let me meet you where you are. Let me show you the destination, but let me walk with you as we both arrive that to me is something that you know manifests itself in a thousand different ways but i really do believe is a point of emphasis right now that the holy spirit is uh, is speaking into the world especially from our worldview 21st century americans i think that's a big ticket thing right now for the holy spirit and you know charlie deacon charlie that's uh, our school our, our website deepadventure.com bear school of manliness it comes out of that you know we have the man cave where men can it's like it's a non-Facebook environment uh, yeah. where men can share. But then we have our, our monthly Zoom meetings. And in those Zoom meetings, p- the men develop relationships with e- each other, you know, and so that it kind of has that there's people kind of ide- have identified with certain people and then they develop that relationship. But we're going through that three-year cycle of, of the school of manliness together. 
And then the yeah. fathers are, and also the fathers are doing that with their sons, as we they do with other men. They're leading their sons also. And if you know, men right now they feel isolated and they they feel alone. And I'll tell you, one of the biggest things I think that isolates men from really uh, from from brotherhood is pornography. I think men are mm-hmm. so so ashamed of of themselves being run over by the pornography bus yeah. uh, and other perhaps other addictions. And you just got to realize you're a man. And when you come when you come into the company of other men, um, no one's judging you. We're there to we're there to we're there to to, to um, say you know this is where you are. This is where you want to be, like you said, and let's accompany you on another journey. But men are isolated in their shame. They're isolated in their feelings of failure in their career. They're, they're isolated in their feelings of I've got more bills than I've got income. And we don't want to admit that, hey, man, I need help. And when you come to a place like the Man Cave or, or the That Man Is You program or other things like that, you find out we're all bozos on the same bus. You know, we all, sure. we all have the same challenges. And what we need to do is stop building walls, uh, isolating from other people, but actually opening up our hearts and saying, hey, will you walk with me? And, and I'm willing to walk with you. Deacon, and, how, uh, can, how can people find you? They can find me at deaconcharlie.com. So that's uh, D-E-A-C-O-N-C-H-A-R-L-I-E, deaconcharlie.com. And you'll find um, access there to uh, to my weekly podcast, Living the Call. Oh, yeah. Great show. And, uh, yeah, you've been on it. We've had great guests like you. Um, and um, you can you know see uh, speaking appearances, listen to homilies, all that kind of stuff. Connect with my wife as well, who uh, you can find through that site, and she's that got her own. That is so degree. cool. Yeah. You, oh, that's so cool. The deacon's wife. You know, it's, it's a it's a ministry you both share. And I, just say the website one more time. Sure, it's deaconcharlie.com. This is the Bear Wozniak adventure. Until next week, may the breath of the Holy Spirit aloha you, aloha. Hey, if you haven't been to the Bear Wozniak DeepAdventure.com web store, you really will be shocked what we have there. We have all of my books, and since I'm a Benedictine oblate, we have the St. Benedict exorcism necklaces and rings and crosses too, plus tons of cool t-shirts for men and women, wrist rosaries, warrior rosaries, daily inspirational journals for either a man or a woman, and so much more. Our DeepAdventure.com web store is awesome. So check it out if you want to find the perfect gift.